go for it. Um, Onyeka, do you want to start the recording so we, we can share this with the wider world at uh, another time? <laughs> Yes, the recording started. Great. Okay. Welcome everyone to today's Lottie Show and Tell. We've got Andrew Parson and Bradley Cooper from the South London Partnership and Sutton and Kingston to take us through their IoT work and an update on, on that program. So I will hand over to them to uh, take us through what, what they've been up to. Well, thank you. And um Good morning. Uh, so I'm Andrew Parsons. I'm the IoT Programme Manager. On the call today, we've got Bradley Cooper. Who, Hi, everyone. There we are. Bradley, do you want to just introduce your role, please? Yeah, no problem at all. My name is Bradley Cooper. I'm the uh, Spark Place Project Manager at the London Brussels and, and Kingston. I work for and Kingston on digital projects that impact on people. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the early response project I've been working on. Thank you, Bradley. And by the way, your mic has done Dalek mode, so we might have to fill in some of the gaps for you. So um, would you mind just going forward one slide, please, Jay? So for the benefit of everyone, um, myself, Bradley and Pierre work for the South London Partnership. Um, we are hired by Sutton and Kingston, but we are working on behalf of the South London Partnership to deliver this on, on ultimately behalf of five boroughs. So what is it we're doing here? Five boroughs submitted a joint bid. They received um, a significant uh, pot of money to trial IoT sensors and deployments across the five boroughs um, over initially a 36 month program. It was extended by six months due to COVID. Um, so the present end date is March 2023. And I would say I think the interesting thing here is that despite there being many similar challenges, there is a very different uptake approach and attitude towards problem solving. And I think that would then reflect well across the boroughs within London, if you see what I mean. So next slide, please. So what we're talking about here and why Bradley is very much involved, because Bradley has absolutely with Pierre and others led this area. So it's not fair that I speak on his behalf. So. What we'll do now, if Bradley, would you like to just bring us up to date, please, on the background to the census, where we are and, you know, some of the good news stories and what we're seeing already, please. No problem at all. Um, as you all know, I've been working quite closely with everybody on with Lottie and all the other local Lottie boroughs on assisted technology. And I'm quite invested in ensuring that we get sensors out into the community to get effective insights in terms of behavior patterns to see whether or not we can affect change in some of the practices that we have now in um as part of this project we had a challenge set to us um which was there was a number of ilos supporting residents in the borough and as a result of covid19 their challenge was in terms of accessing residents and supporting them safely so a challenge went to the market where we were after a, a solution that could be posted and placed didn't require batteries um would last for quite a long time without any intervention at all. And um, we awarded a contract to a company called IoT Solutions Group, and they've provided us with a single sensor, as you can see, very small, that can be posted to a resident and placed in their kitchen, and it starts picking up um, activities of daily living in that kitchen environment. So if you do things like boil a kettle, heat a meal, um, on our dashboard, that information is logged for the ILOs independent living officers and they can see that somebody's active and doing okay if that activity declines or stops they're alerted and they can make contact with the resident the system also picks up your body alerts which is interesting and we've rolled out a hundred of these sensors into sutton sutton housing partnership at the moment and we've already had some fantastic good news stories so within the first week of installing um we had two residents that come through and one had fallen and hurt themselves and broke their hip in the bathroom. Another had fallen asleep on the sofa and was really unwell, and a family member had to intervene. Now, the two key differences at the moment, you all probably are aware, that they weren't wearing their pendant alarms, even though they did have them. And this system, using predictive analytics, was able to identify the problem, send the appropriate alert, and enable services to intervene at the right time. Now, we were told that the first resident that had broken their hip, if this hadn't sent an alert and she hadn't summoned help because she was very, very poorly, she might have passed away. So again, I think I've said before, the importance of looking at sensor-based technology is incredibly important at the moment. And I think this is a great example of it. 
Thank you, Bradley. And and John, because you're on and, you know, this is about assistive tech. Now, there's there's a few other things we'll talk about, if you see what I mean. But have you got any specific questions that you'd, you know, you'd like to ask? And, you know, Bradley, Pierre, I can happily answer just, just as you're on, really. Sure. Um, so these sensors, um, what are you using a sensor suite or is it just one particular type of sensor, a motion sensor? No, I think it's it's not a motion sensor. I've got to be really clear about that. It's not using motion. And I think it is only one sensor. And I think if, if you um, have been involved in sensor based trials, we tend to find that um, there can be challenges in terms of the ecosystem. We wanted a single solution that required no installation that could be posted out and placed. Um, and we have to intervene again for some time, particularly during this difficult time of the pandemic. It uses NBIoT, it's LPWAN, it's low powered, and yeah, it's pretty good actually. But yeah, I think just picking up on Bradley's point and just for the benefit of all, there is absolutely no motion traced, if you see what I mean. Nothing it, at all. it picks up on activities that have happened in the kitchen. And the simple reason it's a kitchen is, it's a primary source of cooking or hot drinks, if you see what I mean. So it's a really good indication for practically all our lives, if we reflect on it, as to what time you've got up in the morning and probably when you've gone to bed, basically. And, you know, whether you have two, three, four meals a day, there will be a pattern that is built up. And, and I know Bradley's suffering a little bit with audio, but what we are starting to see is some really clear pictures of people's, you know, behaviour. We don't we don't know what's really happening in that house, but we do have a that, you know, Andrew gets up at X time every morning, but has a line on a Saturday and Sunday. That's fine. And in the case Bradley talked about the two cases and particularly the, the poor resident with a broken hip, you know, the, the paramedics were very clear. The lady was on such a low body temperature. She, she would have passed later that day if it hadn't been for the fact that we'd seen a fuel poverty alert that, you know, the ILOs followed the correct process. And obviously COVID makes it trickier, but then gained access to the property and found a lady who was very poorly, if you see what I mean. Um, what we also found as well is that there have been, we believe, probably six cases of potential fuel poverty out of the first batch of residents. Now, some of those, it could just be the sensors in the wrong place, if you see what I mean. But when conversations have been had, in a couple of cases, there's probably some words that would make you think, oh, that's a question mark. I wonder if we need to follow up on that. So that's not for this program to do, if you see what I mean. But it it gives an independent living officer just a bit more of an insight and something that they can have an informed conversation with. And certainly what I would say, um, and I've seen it where it's multiple senses, if you see what I mean. But this has really started to make, in this case, South uh, Sutton Housing Partnership, think far more about the merits of the technology and Oh, actually, wouldn't it be lovely to know what's happening in the in the lounge, in the bedroom? Because in this poor lady's case, you know, she'd gone to the toilet in the middle of the night, had fallen. Well, if you had a bed and bathroom sensors, you'd have realised it was unusual for someone to spend X hours in the bathroom at midnight, if you see what I mean. And it could have potentially alerted earlier. Now, that's outside the scope of here, but that's that's where we'd like to go next, really. So. I mean, John, is that useful for you just in terms of, you know, just this one and how something so basic is is, is allowing us a few insights? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's exciting stuff. And I think that's where we're, we're going to. I mean, we I don't want to talk about our project, but we have a we have a project which is looking at something slightly similar work with Imperial College. Um, so, again, I, I, two things. First, my audio is not great. And also I've got an ear infection, which means that I can't hear most of the things that people are saying. Um, but one question I'd like to ask is who does the response for the for the for, for the alerts? So um, what we've done, John, is we've we could because we place this into independent living schemes, they have hardwired telecare installed. Okay. And the the idea really behind the, the challenge statement is um, if somebody becomes unwell between calls and they don't press the red buttons, we need some way of alerting. You know, we need some way of knowing that something's changed. And this device does that. The ILOs keep receive alerts every day um, in the morning at, at seven to say, yes, they're OK. Um, and then if they were also declined, they receive an alert to say there's a problem that can be handed over to our telecare provider quite quickly. There's not a challenge there at all. And in any instance with the lady that had the problem that we discussed, um, the resident was then handed back over to Eldercare who sent their mobile response out to check on her. So 
There is, a, as I would say, an emergency red button model inside the properties. And what we're looking at is preventative. Yeah. And this is and also I think we need to be clear, it's very complimentary. In the first of the, in the first case with the lady who was unwell on the sofa, she didn't want to disturb people, but was unwell, if you see what I mean. In the second case, I think, as I understand it, the resident had safely put the red the red thing next to her bed, if you see what I mean, had, had popped to the bathroom without it. And that's when the incident occurred. So so this is complimentary. And as Bradley's just said there. You know, we're looking to see, can we expand this? Can we look to get additional cover beyond the ILOs? But also, if we go back to one very simple thing at the moment, the ILOs contact the residents by phone every seven days. And we, I think we can be fairly certain people aren't just popping to visit their neighbours, etc., which is why this is so insightful, because it just allows you that almost, you know, pane of glass to just go, actually, they are all right. I don't need to worry about them. Or they didn't sound great the other day they're declining as Bradley saying let's take an intervention so that's where we're coming from so if there aren't more questions on this what I was going to do was just also highlight some of the other things we're doing as a program um, and maybe it'll spark some thoughts so would you mind next slide please Jay thank you so the program, so absolutely, assistive technology is one element to this, but we're doing far more. So we're very much looking at doing social distancing and traffic insights. And the simple reason being, as in this case, Kingston and Sutton, we don't have a great insight to what's actually happening. Yes, there are some footfall sensors. Yes, we have anecdotal evidence. And yes, we believe there's mopeds on the high street and mopeds in cycle lanes, etc. But actually, it's possibly hearsay. Is it right? Are the facts correct, if you see what I mean? So what we're looking at doing here and what we have done on the first phase is we've deployed 30 vivacity sensors around Sutton and Kingston town centres and looking to see what's actually happening. So what are the footfall levels? What are the traffic levels? As you can see with the image in the top right, you know, it breaks it down so we can start to work out. Is it majority buses, HGVs, private cars, motorbikes, whatever it is, and actually up obtaining facts. So that's what we're doing. And it's such spark, such an interest. And particularly with the desire to potentially assist people returning to work, it means other than cars, potentially, because I think we're there seems to be a public concern about the use of public transport at this time. One of the things that's immediately come off is what we're doing as a phase two which is we are installing 13 sensors in each borough, so 26 in total, and looking at what is exactly happening in the segregated cycleways, you know, to actually obtain facts again, and to work out are people, you know, potentially going north, uh, north, but then cutting west, or are they going east? So we're trying to work out then where we need to adjust our routes, really. So very much this is it's early days. We're actually live on a number of these cameras about four weeks now. And Bradley's ones around the same period. So it's very new, but it's very interesting. You know, for example, Pierre and I were looking at cameras on Sunday just randomly. And you can see it's been sunny because there's a certain cut through in central Kingston. And the bike numbers, the push bike numbers are really high. And so are the number of pedestrians. So you can start to build up pictures. And I think potentially when we are allowed to return or whatever the new normal is, it will be incredibly helpful for the likes of our bid colleagues and our highways colleagues to see what's actually going on. Next slide, please, Jay. So what are we actually doing as well? Well, we've got, so they're live. I presently, we've, we've got a tender that's completing, well, we actually should get the documents today, Croydon Digital uh, Town Hub. Um, but on top of that, we've got another 30 use cases and they could be anything from communal facilities such as shower blocks. What is the usage where, you know, how much therefore do we need to clean? For argument's sake, is the toilet used 50 times a day, the shower used four and the sink used 70? How can we create a cleaning regime that goes with it? We're looking at fly tipping. We just actually had a use case approved only yesterday to progress with fly tipping. And we're looking at doing six static cameras where the problems just repeat week on week on week. And then we're looking to link it into a wider press campaign to do hotspot areas. So they will be cameras that will stay three months at a place and then move to you know, the next location. Um, 
We believe there are instances of cuckooing, modern slavery and drug dealing in certain blocks and certain apartments. Again, we're looking to see if we can do things like footfall sensing. Can we dictate, you know, can we reasonably assume that those behaviours are, un, you know, are unusual? We're not spying on people. We're just trying to gain some data to help the team establish if there is a problem that needs investigating. Um, and then we've got things like commuter and school child exposure tracking we're looking at. What's the power of the green wall? So what's the air quality like before the green wall? And what's it like on the other side of the green wall? And then the other one that's gaining momentum is linking back to the vivacity sensors. Could we put air quality sensors almost on the same spot and start to then go, right, for absolutely, we know on this date, this time, X vehicles went past of Y makeup and the air quality was the following. So it removes the need for modeling and everything else. And it removes the need from just saying, well, the air quality is this, but we don't know how it got there. So trying to link the two together. So really, there's a really big opportunity there. And the very last point is very important in that it says data platform. One of the things we're doing at the moment, we are buying solutions from companies that all have a lovely dashboard and they're all you know, good for what they do. And one of the things Pierre Bradley and I are working on is to bring together a dashboard that almost with something like a foundation stone for argument's sake, weather data, vivacity data, MasterCard data, O2 data, something else. Can we then start adding other pieces in and start going, actually, we see fly tipping when the weather's X degrees and the traffic volumes are at Y, if you see what I mean. So, so trying to see if we can get more from just the little elements of data by combining them. Um, and, you know, as the six month view here says, our goal is to have 10 to 15 live pilots by July time ish. We have engaged Kingston University. They are a valuation partner. Um, we are literally just finding our feet working together. And we've we've asked them to look at the COVID-19 and the social distancing to see how they feel they can uh, get more insights on this. Um, and, and the other two that really there, because I think it's pertinent and very much in the news at the moment, we are we have funded a company, Designs for Lampposts, to look at all five boroughs to work out what the lamppost makeup is in those five boroughs and actually to see, therefore, what asset base does that form? And is it perfect for small cells, IoT, whatever it is, if you see what I mean? Or conversely, is there a problem? So, again, we're looking at what wider assets we can do. Uh, and the last point there on the legal options for CCTV. CCTV is one of those very emotive subjects. I think people accept it's useful for crime and other things. But as the BBC article on Wednesday showed about views on um, potentially people dumping litter out their cars. While I think we'd all agree throwing litter out isn't acceptable, it is potentially, is that a big brother step too far on the spying part? I don't have an opinion. But what we're trying to do here is look for what legal options are available to us and therefore consider does IoT, could we gain something by having a look at a feed with some machine learning behind it and start getting information that would be useful? So that's where we are. Um, next slide, please, Jay. And then really, what, what is our end goal? Our end goal, and Pierre reminds me of this regularly, and it's absolutely right to, what, what's been a success, but more importantly, what's been a failure? What could we have done differently? If, if you were other boroughs listening to some of this, what could we say hand on heart would be a good idea and what wouldn't be a good idea? What's probably value for money. So, so that's really what we're trying to do with this pilot is to help the five boroughs actually understand what is worth investing in. And I personally believe success will be the elements we are paying to trial if others then wish to find out of their budgets to take over those trials and continue. I think that would be deemed a success in many cases. So. I'm conscious there's five minutes to go, so I was going to wrap up here and just say, are there any questions for Pierre Bradley or myself? I can see there's oh. chat in the background, sorry. So 
John, because I know Bradley's got audio problems. Absolutely, in terms of consent, everything is fully verbal and documented consent because we can't do written in the present climate. Um, and we have actually, you know, we, we won't hide it. We've had residents who've said yes, and then for reasons we don't quite understand yet, said, I've changed my mind. Um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and then we've had other residents who've said, we'd love now to join. Can I can I have a bit of that, please? So, so it absolutely is all by consent. We've done very clear uh, comms and Bradley has absolutely done a fantastic job in making sure that the residents, certain housing partnership are engaged. And more importantly, you've probably seen it. You know, we've done some positive press statements because actually I reflected on it a couple of weeks ago. and We've all talked about it since. There's not often actually in our jobs. Can we make a difference to someone's life? Well, in a very small way, the other day we did. And that's a nice thing to do. Sorry, Joe. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andrew and Bradley. Uh, it was really insightful. Um, I think 